On this episode of Skeptico, the science battle. And a clip about a real battle. What the hell is your delay, Captain? We're waiting, sir. Waiting for what? Private Doss. Who the hell is Private Doss? That's from the movie Hacksaw Ridge, the true story of a warrior. In in this episode, we probably call him a light warrior. We'll explain what that means in a little bit. But he's a guy who in World War II wouldn't shoot a gun. But as the scene that I just played shows, he had gained so much respect from his fellow warriors that they wouldn't go into battle until he finished praying. And like I mentioned, real story. This guy, Private Doss, was a real person, conscientious objector went into one of the most horrific battles in World War II, bullets flying all over his head, pulls at least 75 soldiers out of the battle to safety, risking his own life every time, going back and back and back to save more lives. Yeah, that's a warrior. But you might be asking, what's all this warrior stuff? I mean, we're just talking about science here, right? He would try to tell other lay people, you see, he's not a real scientist. He's more of a sort of a mystic, but it's true. I became a neuroscientist based on a few uh, spiritual experiences uh, that happened in my life. That's Dr. Mario Beauregard. And if you've been around Skeptico for a long, long time, you'll remember that I interviewed him 10 years ago about his book, The Spiritual Brain, a neuroscientist case for the existence of the soul. Keep in mind, this guy's not a religious guy. He's just following the data. So now Dr. Bogart has a new book, and you'll hear about it in this interview with him. But you also hear that although he's been engaged in the battle for a while, he's a warrior that senses that the battle is changing. It's very hard to be able to unite because there are many differences. Even post-materialist scientists include people who are not spiritual at all. A lot of these scientists, they don't want to have any problem and they don't want to go out and to face, uh, they are not warriors, light warriors. They're not willing to do that. But in my case, it's very different. I'm uh, all for it. I'm a warrior. I'm used to it because I've been trained like this. I, I, I had to fight for my survival. And so it's okay for me. We're fighting with more than uh, materialist atheist in, uh, or so-called skeptics in science. The fight is much bigger now. It's dark versus light. It's darkness and uh, it's a spiritual war. Like you, I'm, I'm not religious at all. My parents wanted me to become a priest, but uh, that was, it was not for me. I have a sense of mission, so I do what I have to do. I don't care if people like me or hate me, but you know what? By doing what I've done, I made a lot of friends all over the planet. The ultimate version of materialism and atheism is transhumanism. And I'm uh, in contact with people all over the planet and friends. And the same process is going on in many, many countries. And yes, a lot of people were, were not realizing what was going on. Now they're switching. They're changing. I can see that everywhere. So I'm very optimistic. But... It will be rough, bumpy for a while, but uh, I think they are cooked (laughs) on the other side. I can't stay here while all them go fight for me. But you figure this war is just going to fit in with your ideas? I don't know how I'm going to live with myself if I don't stay true to what I believe. And so the battle continues. No big. We were made for this. We were made for this time, this place, this battle. Stick around for my interview with Dr. Mario Beauregard. If you like it, tell somebody. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris. And today we welcome, actually welcome back, Dr. Mario Beauregard to Skeptico. If you've been with Skeptico for a while, you might remember 10 years ago, it's really been that long, when we interviewed Mario about his excellent book, Brain Wars. But in case your memory doesn't stretch back that far, let me just kind of remind you, 
Dr. Mario Beauregard is a neuroscientist, multiple fellowships, dozens and dozens of peer-reviewed papers, publications all over the place. I'm even pulling up a picture of him hanging out with the Dalai Lama. He's done all these other really cool projects all around this idea that maybe we should look beyond materialism. And that would lead us to his latest book, Expanding Reality, the Emergence of Post-Materialist Science. So, Mario, welcome back to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for uh, <clears throat> having me. Well, great. So tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. You've been hanging around with those wonderful folks at the University of Arizona and their consciousness paradigm busting exploits or, or endeavors lately. But what's going on in your world in general? Catch us up before we start talking about the book. Well, uh, during the last few years, I, I've been involved in the, the development of what we could call the post-materialist paradigm. So we first met at the University of Arizona in 2013. So it was after Grain Wars. And uh, so we met with Gary Schwartz and I from the University of Arizona and uh, Lisa Miller, a research psychologist at Columbia University. We organized a meeting and uh, people from various uh, fields, uh, physics, mathematics, uh, biology, uh, medicine, psychology, we, we gather with these people. And lots of these people were very well known, like uh, Charles Starr, for instance, Dean Radin, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, Larry Dossie, and so on and so forth. All mavericks in their own fields all black sheep, if you will. The meeting lasted for a few days and we examined all the evidence, the empirical evidence in various fields of research, uh, challenging directly the old materialist view. And uh, following that, a few months after that, uh, I drafted what became to be known as the manifesto for a, a post-materialist science. And uh, we all worked together on uh, multiple drafts, and it was published uh, four or five months after the meeting that was held uh, in March of 2000, uh, I think, 14. And the manifesto was published three, four months later. And after that, there, there were uh, a lot of reactions uh, from the materialists, <laughs> of course, but also from other people. And we, we asked people who were uh, in line with this manifesto to, to sign it, to endorse it. And we received hundreds of uh, signatures. And many of these people, uh, we signed the manifesto, they were very well-known uh, researchers, but many of them were retired. So it was not too dangerous to, uh, for them to sign it. And then it was uh, translated in uh, various languages around the world. And three years after that, we met again in Tucson, Arizona, and then we created an academy, the Academy for the Development of the po of Post-Materialist Sciences, and with, with pretty much the same uh, founders, the same people. So now it's growing, and we've published a few books, collective books, uh, about the, uh, the primacy of consciousness and also the new, the emerging post-materialist paradigm. Uh, expanding reality, it's, it's about all of these uh, developments, but it's for lay people. It's not for scientists themselves, but um, it's very simple to, uh, to read. But it's, it's a summary of all the empirical evidence uh, showing us that now we need to switch to a new paradigm that we call post-materialist, but post-materialist doesn't mean much. It means that we are at a certain point from a, an historical perspective and that we need now to undergo transition toward something different. But the, this emerging paradigm is very much complementary with what was said for centuries by all the great spiritual traditions of the world. So it's like if science is now the new science of consciousness is converging with spirituality in a certain sense. Well, I think that's that's fascinating. I've been on this trail with you for mm -hmm. a while in my own way, and I think it's all 
fine and good. And we're going to kind of get past all the fine and good for a minute. But for I first wanted to touch on this book. I think a lot of people will find it, a lot of people listening to this show will find Expanding Reality, the Emergence of a Post-Materialist Science, a relative quick read, you know, a lot of stuff that we've kind of heard before, but it's nicely organized. I'll tell you, Mary, the one thing that really caught my attention and kind of surprised me was your personal spiritually transformative experience, and in particular, how you feel it's directly guided your work in this area. I just, I, I got to hear more about that. Well, I, I, before that, I, I didn't want to talk about this because I thought that it was uh, in the perception of people and especially my enemies, my, the, the materialists, the atheists, uh, contaminating science, that they would use this information to attack me and they would try to uh, tell other, you know, lay people, you see, that he's, got, he's, uh, he's something, uh, he's not a real scientist, he's more of a sort of a mystic, or, but it's true, it's true that I became a neuroscientist based on a few uh, spiritual experiences that, that happened in my life. It's, uh, I'm not alone, because at, at the academy, we, um, we're now, now creating a new book, and uh, that will be published probably, in, uh, I think, by the end of next year. And it's a collection of essays by 50 different scientists. And you can see when you read the, these accounts, it's very interesting because a lot of scientists decided to become scientists because of spiritual experiences. But it's, it was never told before because it was taboo. We, we couldn't say that. Uh, openly. Now I don't care. I'm almost 60 years old and a vast portion of my career is behind me and uh, I don't care anymore. I'm, I, I don't care what, what people may think. But yes, the first experience happened when I was eight years old. My parents were farmers uh, here in the province of Quebec in Canada. And uh, we, we had uh, fields for the cows. And we had a small forest. And uh, during uh, the summer break, I went into the, the small forest. I, I liked to go there to think and to play and encounter all sorts of animals. And, uh, it was quite hot. And after uh, I walked for uh, about an hour and then I, was, uh, I became tired and I decided to, to sit on a big gray rock. And uh, while I was sitting on the big gray rock, I looked at all the trees that were surrounding me and. I could see also the field, um, but which was uh, far away, and the cows. And all of a sudden, uh, everything became uh, more vibrant. I knew that trees were live alive, but I, I entered into a sort of uh, enlarged state of consciousness, and I realized that all the uh, the, the trees, the grass, and e even the rock itself were all part of a single whole, uh, a unified being. And I, me, the small Mario, was part of this uh, unified field, this, you know, being. And so to me, I, I was, my parents were Roman Catholic. And uh, so I thought that uh, I had encountered God. But what was interesting in this experience is that after that, after this insight, it's like if I downloaded information about my life plan. I, I received information showing that I was supposed to become uh, later on, because I was only eight by, by then, but I would become a neuroscientist. And my task would be to unite with other scientists around the world to, to demonstrate that the brain does not create the human essence, mind, consciousness, spirit. It's, it acts as an interface. So that was the starting point. And then I became very sick 12 years at the beginning of my uh, 20s, and I've had a near-death experience. And during the, the near-death experience, uh, I've received more information about the, the kind of research program I would undergo a few years later. And so 
may, many, many times, journalists ask me, uh, why did you do the, the study you did uh, with regard to spirituality and, you know, n contemplative nuns in, in the scanners, things like that, near-death experiences? That was the, these two experiences were the, uh, the main reason, I have to admit. <laughs> That's really great. And I'm glad you shared that because one of the interesting things about your work that you have to, you don't really have to dig that far to get it, but is this spiritual angle? You know, you wrote a book, The Spiritual Brain. Yes. Yeah. You've done, like I said, you've sought out the Dalai Lama to connect with spiritual people. You talk about spiritually transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. And even that, you know, is a line that some folks in this frontier science, post-materialist kind of thing, it's a line that they don't want to cross. And it's understandable too. It's particularly understandable for people who haven't had that direct experience. You know, I've spoken with Dean Radin a couple times. I don't get the sense, and I've asked him, that he's had that kind of direct no. spiritual experience. So he doesn't report on that. In a way, it's even, it's, it's, it's wonderful that we can have people who can intellectually get there as well as people who can experientially get there and then say, now let me see if my science can can help me mm -hmm. get there exactly. as well. So yes. what do you make of that on a practical level? Because you, you are a guy who has this then spiritual insight, the spiritual knowing that is so, so profound. But you've mm -hmm. also had to walk a careful path down the the science yes. road. Oh, and, yes. And it's because I got a lot of thoughts on that, a lot of concerns that maybe we're not being aggressive enough in really kind of calling bullshit on what's happened. Yes. Well, I, I've not been balanced. I've not been wise because uh, after these experiences, I knew exactly what I had to do and I wanted to do. Uh, so when I, I received my PhD at the University of Montreal, uh, I had to do a, a postdoctoral fellowship. That, that, that how it works. I, I so I checked the entirety of neuroscience back then. Uh, it was in the you know in 90, the beginning of the nineties. Nobody was doing the kind of research I wanted to do. So I knew that I had to do something else. Uh, I had to wait for a few years. So I decided to become an expert in brain imaging because brain imaging was emerging. And I knew that it would be a useful technology to study these experiences and to see what's going on in the brain. And, uh, uh, but I, I also met with famous neuroscientists who were still alive back then. And I told them about my dream, what I wanted to do. And they told me, don't do this because you're going to kill yourself. It, it's a suicide. <laughs> you will be destroyed. And uh, I asked them why? Why? Because uh, it, it, it's then that I discovered that uh, neuroscience is supposed to be objective, but uh, as a science, but science is not objective because it's conducted by human beings. And human beings have all their, they have, uh, they have their own belief systems. They have emotions, uh, motivations, hidden agendas, and so on and so forth. And then I discovered that neuroscience was like, uh, uh, you know, religion. And there was a Vatican, there was a Pope, and uh, there were a few central dogmas that you have to respect. And one of these dogmas was the, the, idea that the brain produced the mind as uh, for instance the liver uh, secretes certain enzymes stuff like that and uh, so I, I start right then I started to fight with these uh, famous people from the Montreal Neurological Institute and uh, they were I realized that they were playing a game uh, but the system was built upon a certain number of these assumptions. And, and they, they made me realize, they told me, if you're not wise, and if you don't respect, you don't play the game correctly, you will be expelled. That, that's what is going to happen to you. And that's, this is exactly what happened 17 years after that. 
at the University of Montreal. So I, I went to the United States to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the University of Texas in uh, Houston for a few years. And then I came back at McGill University at Mont the famous Montreal Neurological Institute that was created at the end of the uh, 20s by uh, Wilder Penfield, famous neuroscience, one of the uh, pioneers of the neuroscience. And Penfield started as a mainstream uh, scientist, as a, an atheist. Uh, and uh, at the end of, the more he was pro progressing in his career, the, the more he started to have doubts about the central dogmas of neuroscience. And at the end of his, his life, he, was, he had become a dualist. He, uh, and he wrote a little book about this and uh, he was all quite old by then and his colleagues that I met uh, who were very old, they uh, all thought that he has lost, you know, his, <laughs> his compass, that uh, he lost it because he was a bit demented. But, it, you know, he, he was uh, seeing very clearly and uh, but, you know, all these guys, what they had told me was right. And I experienced it myself because after um, McGill University, I, the uh, University of Montreal hired me to become a, a researcher there. And we were starting the new brain imaging center. And uh, so I was involved in that. And everything went well for a number of years when I was doing the uh, the classical studies that they were expecting me to do and the partnership with Big Pharma and things like that. They, they, they enjoyed that. And there's a lot of money involved in this. And uh, But that's not what I wanted to do. So I started to do studies that were considered to be, uh, that, that didn't fit within the, the, the system uh, because I, for instance, I uh, convinced uh, uh, Carmelite nuns who were living in a convent and they were contemplative, so they, they were not supposed to, to leave the, the, the convent. But after several months of discussion, I, I managed to convince them to leave the convent and to lay inside a scanner, functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner and uh, to try to enter into a spiritual uh, state and so on and so forth. And I've done several studies like that. And uh, then I started to have problems with the, the direction of the, uh, the medical school at the University of Montreal because, and they started to uh, try to intimidate me because they, they, they told me that uh, they could play with my life professionally, with my salary. With uh, and uh, if I didn't listen to what they were telling me, uh, bad things would happen to me, and so I've been bullied like that for years. I never talked about this openly, that's the first time I do that, and I don't care if they come back and because I have too many proof evidence of that. And behind closed doors. They, to, they told me, you know, the, the leaders of the, uh, the medical school, you cannot do this within the walls of University of Montreal, this type of studies. We don't want that. We want you to do partnership with Big Pharma and you know, the classical studies using all the various tools of neuroscience. And, uh, and I said no every time. They were doing that once a year reviewing what I had done. So they refused to give me my tenure, even though I was, I was bringing them visibility all over the planet. I was invited to meet with the Dalai Lama. I was invited uh, to, to speak at the uh, United Nations in uh, New York, uh, the department concerning uh, science and evolution of society and so on and so forth. I was bringing them a lot of visibility, but not the kind of visibility they uh, expected from me. They didn't want that. because, And I, I realized that they were there to maintain uh, an ideology in place. They, they were not interested in truth. They were not, no, they were interested in the, you know, they had a system and they wanted to protect the system. And, you know, I, so I was a black sheep. I was a maverick and people start to say that about me uh, all over the planet, but they, 
But since I was a nice person, the uh, it was going well all over the planet. I received offers from various universities around the world, in the United States and Brazil. And, and people were, were telling me, uh, we uh, we want you to create something new, and um, so. But I was expelled in 2013 from the University of Montreal. My my contract, my research contract, even though I had grants, uh, it was not renewed, and they did, they were not able to give me the the reasons, the official reasons, because of course I would have hired a lawyer and I would have sued them. But but some people spoke to me. People who were who members of the com committees who decided uh, what will what would happen with me. And uh, some people have told me, so I know. And the reasons were purely ideological. The, you know, yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was a black sheep, really. And they didn't want that. So a few weeks after that, Gary Schwartz, who was at the another controversial researcher, but at the University of Arizona, uh, a few years before that, uh, at the University of Arizona, they created the first uh, research center on consciousness. And uh, several well-known scientists and philosophers of science, uh, like David Chalmers, uh, they were all involved in the creation, Amroff and uh, others, they were involved in the creation of this center. And Gary Schwartz didn't know me personally, but it's, it's so funny because he said, there's an inner voice that told me to contact you. So he found my email address. He, he had seen my books, so he knew I was a, but, and, and then when I saw him <laughs> online, um, he told me, uh, is there something wrong or is there something that I could do for you? Because I'm uh, pushed to, I don't know, uh, I feel that I have to uh, call you and to ask you what's going on. And so I explained to him what had just happened to me. He said, uh, at the University of Arizona, we would be proud to have somebody like you. We wouldn't see you like uh, a black sheep, but to, uh, to the contrary. Because there's open-minded, more open-minded for various reasons because of the people that were there. And uh, so, so it was a, a mix back. You know, you, you, you had also the, uh, the uh, atheist materialist, but you had also more open-minded people. So that's how I became affiliated with the University of Arizona. It's another interesting uh, story. And that's how, uh, after uh, having talked to uh, Gary and who I, uh, I proposed, you know, to launch this uh, new most post-materialist movement and so he helped me and we organized the, the first meeting and then the manifesto then the academy and so on and so forth so right now i'm doing theoretical work about uh, a new model of mind brain uh, relationship uh, including uh, spirituality spiritual experiences now that's i think that's uh, it's a new to me it's this is the real new science of mind and consciousness not not the old stuff of candle and edelman and uh changeur and all these guys, old guys uh, you know they did um yeah so 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 i'm very much involved in this uh transition toward something new and uh there's progress because some uh people like for instance christoph uh, cook was working with um, you know uh, Francis Crick for several years. He was a uh, an open uh, materialist atheist, like like his former boss. And uh, now he's changes uh, discourse. Now now he's stuck. He's, he's you know he's coming you know very slowly to our camp because he's recognizing that perhaps perhaps we won't be able to use materialist models to explain or to reduce consciousness so it's a, a primary principle but uh, he, he's still trying to uh, like like david jalmers also and uh, but these guys are uh, to me they they're like chicken they don't uh, they're not as enough courageous to say openly you know t tell what you think really um because they're you know they have things to protect 
the uh, Cook direct. Uh, he's the director of a research center and or an institute and so on and so forth. And in my case, I never, I never cared about all those things, and I destroyed several relationships and I lost many opportunities because of that. Because I, uh, you know, I was, uh, <laughs> I didn't care. You know, I just cared about what I felt deep within and my sense of mission, what I had to accomplish. I knew, and I knew it would be a, a battle, but, uh, you know, I decided to go for it because uh, it's who I am. So <laughs> I think that's a really, really important story. And I'm glad you shared all that. I'm glad you shared that about Gary Schwartz, because a lot of times he doesn't get credit for standing and holding that space, you know, so he's done some things and people can kind of laugh, you know, Geraldo and all the rest of that stuff. But no, he has marched forward and held that space and he's brilliant right i mean mm -hmm. yale oh, yes. harvard you know all that oh, the, yeah, the yeah. maximum credentials but the other thing that you said that i think is 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 the next level stuff that we got to get to if we're really going to support gladiators of the light which you are mario you are a gladiator of the light you are not interested in compromise where in, in the scientific sense, right? A scientist right. isn't interested in stupid ideas and compromising and saying, well, you know, everybody has a point of view. And if you kind of ran the numbers this way, no, that's our, that's the beauty of science is it allows us to play this game that we really can measure things. Cause we know we can't really measure things, but if we were going to measure things, this is the result that we have. And this is where we get. So one of the things I want to do, in this interview is kind of pull you further into and get your thoughts on how deep this thing goes, how deep this battle, and it really is, and this is again gonna turn people off, but at some level, this is a deeper spiritual battle that we are somehow engaged in. And I say that not knowing what that means. I'm not a Christian, I'm not at all a religious person, but it's kind of hard to deny that there's some elements to this that do look like a battle. Let me play you a clip because in your book, in this latest new book that people really need to check out as well as your other books, Expanding Reality, one of the things you touch on because you have to, because it's such an important part of this whole story, it's such an important part of reclaiming our history is the remote viewing project Stargate at SRI but it goes very deep and in some ways it goes much darker than we're willing to sometimes go to let me play this clip it's a couple minutes long and okay. then let's talk about it i have an interview coming up in a minute with lance Maria, the creator of the fantastic movie third eye spies a true story of cia psychic spying Okay, I don't really have to play that clip, and you can go listen to that show if you want. But also, I don't have to play that clip, because I kind of tee it up and summarize it to Mario here. So let me stop it there. My point is, we have to fully embrace this history. We have to pull it apart. And I think frontier scientists like you are, and we know the frontier scientists because they don't only have arrows in the front from the people they're pushing against and they have arrows in the back too because that's the guy who's always out front he's got arrows in his back as well as his front this is our history so part of this history is fuck yes we did this post-materialist bullshit so the people at montreal they're playing some kind of game because the real players at mcgill locked in the mk ultra lab they were way past materialism they were how do we operationalize this how do we mind control people how do we do telepathy how do we do remote viewing they weren't sitting around wringing their hands going gee is remote viewing true or is sensory deprivation true is disassociative identity and split person is that true they were not questioning that they were operationalizing it that is our history and so that's i guess point number one and point number two that comes along with it is a bunch of other weird stuff that we don't talk about because it's not comfortable to talk about but it you know that would include all the ufo stuff and all that so let's just start with the first part of embracing our history fully engaging with it and number two calling bullshit 
on this idea that the academy is only against this because it's oh it's dogma and it's one funeral at a time bullshit Th there is some kind of directive behind this that says we do not want to go in this direction we do not want people thinking that there's that there are these expanded divine beings that are somehow connected to something much more we want them to stay limited controlled biological robot because that's fits more with our agenda. And I'm opinionating there, but I want to lay it out there and get your opinion. Well, yes, I agree with you. It's, a, it's part of a, a social engineering program, clearly. And, uh, you know, in the video, uh, we talked about uh, Sidney Gottlieb. Well, he, he, he uh, had a double life. So he was a well-known neuroscientist, a pharmacologist, uh, worked with uh, Big Pharma, was one of the pioneers, actually. But he had, uh, you know, he was doing uh, in secret all those experiments. And he was doing that with the people at Montreal Neurological Institute, at the Allen Memorial, the Psychiatric Institute. So the, all the, the, the guys I was talking to when I was a young aspiring neuroscientist, these are the, pe the, 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 the same people. Cameron, you, you want to talk about Cameron? I never met him. Uh, camera no but I met all the other ones <laughs> and so they were you know uh, and it was clear that they were upset and one of them told me and she's very she's a celebrity she's almost a uh, hundred years old now very famous I won't mention her name because but people will recognize her and she told me as long as I'm alive and I'm controlling the Montreal Neurological Institute you'll never do studies neuroscience studies on spirituality never so she she organized something with all the other members of the committee the uh, ethics research committee and the scientific committees to prevent me from doing these studies i had uh, earned a, a grant from the templeton foundation based in the united states but i was not allowed they, they blocked me because and what and i asked them what for what, what, what is the reason and i when i started to argue about them regarding spiritual experiences and they were becoming berserk totally like if uh, so and then i i knew that it was more than it, it was a, a a war really between two contrasting two different totally different paradigms dark and it Yes. And light. That's right. what I understood then. Uh, but I couldn't prove it. But now with everything that is happening on the planet regarding the, you know what, um, it's very obvious. <laughs> it's, now it's very clear. I, yeah. I think and, I think um, it is obvious, and I think more people need to stand up and talk about it. And I think we need to wind it back a little bit because they've shifted the game a little bit. It's no longer about consciousness per se. There's no longer the uh, Dawkins and you know no. uh, that kind of stuff. But what they have introduced is kind of a direct, you know, you look at Ghislaine Maxwell being tried now and, you know, but this is Satanism and it's openly satanic practices. And we've interviewed people on this show that have been part of satanic mm -hmm. ritual abuse cults. And you get to this dissociative identity disorder. And again, folks, don't take this wrong. I'm not a Christian. I don't know what a satanic cult is is i don't even know what that means inside of my worldview i know that there is this extended realm that because people like dr beauregard come back and say hey we study it scientifically we study near-death experience i don't know what to tell you there's an extended realm people die and they go someplace there's reincarnation i don't know what to tell you they die we don't have to come to a bunch of firm conclusions we don't have to pull out the bible and say this is what it means we can just say what they're telling us is bullshit. Those guys at McGill, the guys at Montreal knew there was an extended realm and they were playing with it and they were trying to tap into it and they were trying to justify it as 
well, if we don't if we don't tap into it, and this could be both dark or light, if we don't explore all the sides of it, well, then darn it, the Russians will it. And what if they got Satan on their team? And what if? And believe me, folks, these are really the kind. If you look through the documents, the released FOIA documents released in the Canada and recently U.S., this is what these guys are talking about. And in one way, you kind of got to go. Well, I'm glad somebody's at least considering that but where they went with it in terms of the experiments that they did do and where they were willing to go and the lines that they were willing to cross, all of which were in this extended post-materialist realm, it make, gives us pause as to considering what you're saying is, what is really behind them not wanting to go and look at this research? Yes. Well, they are actors. The... the you know they are participating in, the, in this battle but they are on the other side clearly <laughs> yeah because they yeah they the and that it's true that several of these old people were there when i was when i started they they were part of the, the, the this this team exactly that were doing studies in collaboration with cia and the mk ultra program <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so let's let's take this one other direction kind of on a less take it down a notch for people who can't maybe <laughs> go there all the way the other thing that i think you are a testament to in your story your life your documented history in academia you know someone could just go look like you said how do you fire a guy who has a templeton foundation grant how do you do that oh. Oh yeah, and I earned several uh, scientific prizes, awards, and uh, all over the planet. Yeah. So, but so that I, is I, that is the proof right there. And and here's what I'd kind of tie it back to, and that is, have we? And this is the way that most people in in this community, this broader community that you work in, that aren't willing to really entertain that discussion that we just had, they just can't go there. Where they can't go is this idea that you alluded to, that we have a sense right now that in some ways the social contract between science and policy, between science and government, between science and culture, that that contract has in, in a way that I've never seen in my life, just been thrown out the window. I mean, they don't even they don't even pretend to care. And the ignorance is is quite dramatic. Let me play a couple clips really quick and then we'll we'll chat about that. Okay. So the first is from our friend Rupert Sheldrick back in 2013 when he was his TED talk was banned. And I'll play you my show on it, my interview with him, just a few seconds of it and then we'll talk. On this episode of Skeptico Alex talks with Dr. Rupert Sheldrick about being censored by the TED conference. The irony of this is, if not hilarious, it's certainly inescapable. I mean, a reputable scientist publishes a book claiming that science is dogmatic and then is censored by an anonymous scientific board. What does this say how science can be dogmatic without even realizing it's dogmatic? Well, I think in a way, there's this whole controversy and the people who weighed in in favor of the TED actions do indeed confirm what I'm saying, that these dogmas are ones that most people within science don't actually realize are dogmas. They just think they're the truth. And the point about really dogmatic people is that they don't know they have dogmas. Dogmas are beliefs. And people who have really strong beliefs think of their beliefs as the truth. They don't actually see them as beliefs. So I think this whole controversy has actually highlighted exactly that. So I'm going to pause it there for a second. And I would almost say that those are the good old days because it seems like there was some restraint back then. There was actually, it caused a stir when a reputable scientist like Rupert Sheldrick was banned. People were kind of up in arms and say, hey, you can't do that. Science has a right to speak and speak freely. That is our social contract. That is what we, we, we demand. Here but is- It's been broken. It's, been, it's, been, it's not there anymore. So let me play a, a clip from an interview I just did recently with uh, Sarah and Jack Gorman. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. 
these people are super smart, qualified. Sarah, you know, undergraduate degree, Harvard, PhD, Columbia. So speaking of silliness, here's where I start, which seems obvious to me, to anyone who cares about science, and that is, should we limit scientific debate? I, I do think that anybody who spreads information about a medical technology that people need in order to survive, that's not true. And usually it's intentionally not true. I don't think that they should be allowed to have any platform they want. Sarah, who would determine what's not true? Isn't that the job of science? Yeah, well, science has already determined certain things about vaccines that they're safe and effective, certain vaccines that they're safe Does and science effective. Really so I'll, I'll cut it off there. This is the water, unfortunately, you've had to swim in all your life. But what comes through to me, and the reason I played the Sheldrick clip first, and you totally got this, so I want you to speak to it, is it's, it's different now. It's like Sarah Gorman, PhD from Columbia, is really that clueless. She really, if they're burning books in Columbia in the center square that don't agree with her, even if they're from the most reputable scientist who's published in Nature multiple mm -hmm. times, which as many have, and they're being banned, she's like, no, I'm bought into the program that we don't right. have to listen to people who no don't agree with this. So speak yep. to that, because that, that, if nope. people don't get the spiritual warfare, they get, they get that that's somehow a, a, a breaking of that contract. Well, that's the, 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 the kind of scientists who uh, will lead us to uh, a tyranny, tyrannical system. And uh, that reminds me of something, you know, there's a famous university in Paris. Uh, it's very old. It's called La Sorbonne. It's uh, a bit like Harvard, but for the French people. And about 10 years ago, they invited me to give a lecture on my work. And I went there and the, the organizers invited members of the uh, French Academy of Sciences. That's, you know, that, that's an habit over there. That's uh, how they do it. So they, they, they start by listening to you and then they will make comments on what you just presented. So, I was seeing that during my talk, and it lasted for a few hours, their pressure was rising. <clears throat> they, they, had, they were red faced, and uh, at the end, the president of the academy, very uh, a noble man, uh, very well recognized in France, he said, it's too bad that we're not uh, 200 years ago, because uh, you know what we would do with you, or you know what we would like to do with a guy like you. I said, uh, I, I think I have an idea. They would use the, the guillotine, or even they would burn you at the stake. Yeah. And people started to argue with them, in the, because, because there were lay people. It was uh, during an evening, and it was a public uh, lecture. But uh, but for scientists like Sarah, this is exactly and, and this is exactly what's happening with regard to the so-called, uh, you know what? <laughs> because I don't want you to be censored. So, yeah, this is exactly the same process, and there's no end to it. So, and uh, this leads to tyrannical systems and uh, very dangerous because if if you. I agree with you. It doesn't make any sense. Mario, in your career, because I guess one of my one of my gripes, I think frontier scientists like yourself are in a unique position to speak to this and they don't. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't, they don't, and they should, because we have to we have to be the gladiators of light for the spiritual part, but the other part, even if you're not a gladiator of the light, if you're not into all that, you gotta be a gladiator of the truth. And you gotta stand up and say, this is not, this is not right, this is not true. And I think frontier scientists are in a better place to do it. And I think that I'm surprised more of them don't notice where we're at like you do you seem to be able yes. to put your finger on it and say no this is really different we've now crossed a line to speak to that have we how different is this is this feel different to you oh yes yes it's uh no there's no uh respect anymore no uh, examination of the evidence but now they do that openly so uh, with regard to the 
the sanitary uh, state of the world. And uh, so last year, in line with my, my convictions, I uh, participated in a group of people who decided to sue the government, the provincial government and the federal government of Canada. But guess what happened? The judges, they are corrupted. They're part of the same system. So the, my role was to demonstrate scientifically, to review the literature showing that you don't put people in lock, normal, people, healthy people in lockdowns that, that last forever. You don't ask them to wear masks and so on and so forth. And I, I you know, I reviewed all the, the scientific literature about this and we sent that to the, the judges, but it was the Supreme Court, the highest level. The judges never review our uh, lawsuit. They never examined it. They, they decided to sit on it forever to protect the uh, puppet politicians who are in place right now. That's what they did. But it's it's very similar in science. It's uh, and uh, you know they have their own private club. And uh, if you're not a member of this club, and you know you. Uh, it will be very hard to accomplish something unless we unite, you know, but, 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 and, we, but and we need examples. I, I, I'm willing to uh, go because some, a lot of people uh, behind closed doors, scientists, all during all my career, uh, they, they said, that it's nice what you're doing. It's nice. Go to, uh, go there, be the first one to do, because they are not courageous and they want to protect what they have. And so they need other people to uh, fight, you know. <laughs> but but how do we how do we even unite is tricky, right? Because even in this community that you're a part of, the consciousness frontier science community, there's there's divisions, there's still yes. this, there's still yes. this left right thing that goes on and yes. it's it's troubling because i'm like okay i get that some people are just wired to be political i'm not i'm apolitical anyone who, to me anyone who looks at this mm. you you just see it's there's it's there, there's some level of control beyond that but for people who are in that what can we unite on what what do you think is a potential answer of something within this community that they can they can coalesce on and, and everyone can more or less agree. Is it post-materialism? Is it, what do you think it is? Well, science is uh, influential because it has replaced religion as the ultimate cognitive authority. So if you use the angle of science, uh, you, you may convince more people because a lot of people have left the church, the churches for uh, you know, a few decades now. And, uh, so yes, yes, but like you're saying, it's very hard to be able to unite because there are many differences. And, you know, e even post-materialist scientists include uh, people who do not believe at all, who are not spiritual at all. And some of them are even almost atheist. So it's, it's uh, difficult to, uh, but what I decided to do to influence the, uh, the outcome of the, the the future of humanity, I decided last year in response to the so-called uh, pandemic to create a new social network to unite people, conscious, awake people, sp spiritually, spiritual people, we could say, uh, all over the planet. So now it's not only it's not only science or scientists within, because a lot of these scientists do not want to, um, I know them, I interact with them. I'm part of uh, the same academy, but they they don't they don't want to have any problem, and they don't want to go out and to face. Uh, they are not warriors, light warriors. They're not willing to do that, and some of them are quite old now. So I, I can understand, but in my case, it's very different. I, I'm uh, all for it. I'm a warrior. I'm used to it because I've been trained like this. I've been trained. I, I, I had to fight for my survival, and so uh, uh, it's good. It's okay for me to, to to do this kind of job, but with other people. But I need. I think if we have a global, we want a global transformation. We have to unite, but at a much uh, wider scale than simply post-material science. 
I... Now we're <laughs> we're fighting with more than uh, materials atheists in, uh, or so-called skeptics in science. The fight is much bigger now. <laughs> it's dark versus light. It's darkness and uh, it's a spiritual war, like like you said before. To me, I I have a sense that you're spot on on that, and I also think we always have danced with this kind of inherent contradiction of post-materialist, which is kind of a strange term because it isn't really post-materialist. It's like pre-materialist. It's like consciousness is fundamental. Yeah, I agree with you. I didn't choose it. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. No, I totally get that. No, no, you did the right thing, which is if we're going to communicate effectively, sometimes yeah. people don't get that we have to use the term. But I mean, w w you're, you're, you're almost in their playing field and it becomes kind of the Stockholm syndrome kind of thing. But it's like, no, it's obviously not science has obsoleted itself. That's the, the conclusion, right? It's like, we can't really measure in everything because there's something beyond no. that. There's something above right. that. So you can't really get in bed with those people 100%. And that's what I think you're, you're pointing to. And you're saying, yes. we have to, we have to reach towards something beyond that. Let me ask you this as we begin to wrap things up. Mm -hmm. I am fascinated about your precognitive experience that guided your life. And if we circle back to that, it's really quite remarkable. And I have to wonder, do you think you signed up for all of this? Do you think you knew it was going to be like this? Do you think you knew that, you know, you're not going to get, you may not get, you may not get the big prize at the end. You may not get no. the, at the very end you might, but in this realm, right. you may not get the a pat on the back of, gosh darn Mario, you were right all along. <laughs> we're so sorry kind of thing. Are you okay with that? Did you sign up for the whole thing? Yes, yes. Yeah. No, oh, yes. I'm not, I, and like you, I'm, I'm not religious at all. I left the church when I was, uh, he wanted to become, uh, my parents wanted me to become a priest. And, uh, but uh, that was, it was not for me. He sent me to a seminary, but uh, I started to fight with the, the, the priest on, uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, regarding the the Bible content, there are dogmas, and so. Um, but uh, no, I don't. Uh, I'm not doing. The, I have a sense of mission, so I do that. I do what I have to do. I don't care if people like me or hate me, or. But you know what? By doing what I've done, I made a lot of friends all over the planet. I realized that you know, the lay people. I saw a big progression from when I started uh, to travel 30 years ago from now, from uh, past few, the last few years before the, the beginning of this uh, craziness. Uh, there's an evolution of consciousness, really, in society. Uh, I see that. I can see that. I see that because people write to me and talk to me about their own experiences and uh you know when, but and using social media now and uh there's really a so so there will be a big clash because uh and i we're, we're and it's it's right now we're we're in it now it started it, it's about two different worlds two totally different trajectories and uh you know, the, the, the ultimate version of materialism and atheism is transhumanism, you know? So Silicon Valley and all these guys uh, who are prom promising eternity uh, under a different form. And uh, these guys are, uh, you know, this, they are con artists. They don't know anything really about consciousness and spirit. And, uh, you know, they, they, but they are trying to, you know, they're, they're, they're salesmen and they they are trying to convince uh, people so but uh, I'm not I don't think uh, their project will uh, will be successful uh, ah, I want to pick up I want to pick up on that because mm -hmm. I agree with you but I want to be honest about it too and I hold on to two quotes that are are both inspirational and also I think true and the first is Mahatma Gandhi who said good always wins. 
look at it through history. He says, I'm not, uh, pa to, pa he's, I'm paraphrasing, but he goes, look, I'm not saying that just to sound, to make you feel better. I'm like, look at history, good wins, mm -hmm. good wins. But the other quote I really like is from my friend, Miguel Connor, a quote of a quote. He says, evil always turns stupid. And I think, I think we might begin it be beginning to see that there's more exactly. and more people who are just kind of oh. ordinary people who've just kind of helped kept their nose to the grindstone they haven't listened to too much but now they're kind of gone no nah, dog that's that's just too freaking stupid even for me to buy into that well what do you think about that what is, is there a reason to be to maybe t to let the light shine through us do do we have to be dark and, and and do we have to be down about this is there a reason to be optimistic yes yes i i see that and i'm uh, in contact with people all over the planet and friends uh, and uh, the same is process is going on in many many countries and yes a lot of people were were not uh realizing what was going on or were not didn't care about that but now they're switching they're changing i can see that uh, everywhere I, I i have contacts friends and uh, so i'm very optimistic but it will be rough bumpy for a while but uh i think they're cooked <laughs> on the other side right on and i think science is going to play a key role in that because that is the beauty of science it does shine a light towards truth it may not be the truth but it can now nudge us a little closer what do you think real science not pseudoscience like the one utilized used by puppet politicians right right now yeah it's uh <laughs> it's disgusting what, what they are they, it they talk all the time about science and that's not science at all that's pure bullshit that's not true that's yeah we're, we're talking about real science which has the power to, to change to, to transform the world yes so it's been absolutely terrific talking to our guest dr mario beauregard please check out his books his latest expanding reality you will enjoy you can go back and listen to our interview on brain wars and that's still relevant and also uh, check out his very nice uh website where you can uh find what's going on with him and maybe you can tell us in the couple minutes we have left dr beauregard what is coming up in your immediate future you're a busy guy you're very obviously a very driven and focused guy what is coming up for you I'm finishing to create a new uh, psycho-spiritual approach based on all the research I've done throughout my life and also based on the findings of other researchers as well. Uh, I've come with a, a new psycho-spiritual uh, approach to help people, no, uh, not mystics, contemplatives, but normal people to have access to their inner essence, their spiritual side. And uh, I have developed uh, a kind of technology to do this and um, to work with this with regard to all the, the various aspects of human life. It can be emotions, can be uh, the life plan and so on and so forth. So it's a, a huge endeavor and uh, it will become public in uh, 2022 uh, in French, but everything will be translated into uh, other languages. Um, that's fantastic certainly as ambitious when you say technology are you speaking of kind of a, a method a series of techniques or kind of a more no, i use um, i use isochronic sounds to alter the uh, to expand uh, the awareness that's but i'm also uh, using uh, various types of exercises and sometimes guidance like they do in uh, hypnosis a bit but uh, i've been doing this kind of work for now over six years with thousands of people in europe and also in uh, in quebec and canada and uh, i realized that it's because uh very often the the journalists uh, were interviewing me uh, about my my research on spiritual ex experiences they were asking me well, okay, it's it's interesting to know what's going on in the brain, but how does it help normal people? 
to 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 connect so yeah this stayed with me and uh so i worked on this and i i developed an approach to facilitate the access to the uh if the the spiritual world if you will without having to die clinically <laughs> <laughs> that would be a requirement well that's terrific <laughs> and i i do yeah. hope you come back next year when it's out so we can tell people about it because i'm sure a lot of folks yes be because i want to go to you gary schwartz has asked, been asked pushing me uh, since uh, a few years to go to united states present that and i i, w I would like to do that very much too but right now i'm in jail in canada i cannot travel <laughs> you know why <laughs> that's okay it'll, it'll pass it'll pass uh mario it's been terrific terrific having you on best of luck with all that and let's stay in touch you know when you come down to tucson let me know sure okay thanks a lot Alex. thanks again to dr mario beauregard for joining me today on skeptico the one question i tf from this interview is kind of an obvious one what do you think of this idea of a battle in science, light versus dark forces? Come on. I mean, science is about doing good work, about protocol standards, publishing peer review, and deceiving others in order to advance the shadowy agenda of those who would seek to control. No, 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 wait, scratch, scratch that. Of course, that's not in there. That's never a part of science. Let me know where you stand on that one. Love to hear your thoughts. If you like the show, tell a couple people. Lots more to come. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>